Hello, everyone. Happy SL21B. We're going to get started here in a second. Just want to do a quick check to make sure that people are able to hear us. Am I coming through loud and clear? SL21B. I think we're good. Let's get started. Great. Welcome to the third in our series of SL21B town hall events. Earlier this week, we learned quite a bit about the past, the present, and the future of Second Life from our product engineering and product operations teams. And now we are excited to continue the discussions with none other than the original founder of Second Life, Philip Rosedale. Welcome, Philip. Thank you. It's good to be here as always. We always love having you in Second Life. The community looks forward to this every year. So thank you for being with us today. Uh, over the past week or so, we've been gathering questions from our community in preparation for today's Q&A. Many of these questions, as you can imagine, focus on the origins and history of Second Life. But there were also quite a few inquiries about your perspective about many of the current developments going on in the tech industry, things like AI, extended reality, and digital currencies. We'll get into Second Life to be sure, but let's start with your thoughts on various aspect, aspects of artificial intelligence. So the first question coming from the community, you have been, you have quite a bit of post SL experience with the, within the AI space, including your role as an advisor at mid journey. When you think about AI as a specific, as it specifically applies to virtual worlds and communities like second life, do you have any concerns? And in particular, I know that generative AI is something that both interests and even perhaps scares a little bit our community of creators. What are your thoughts? Well, like you said, I, I think generative AI is something that appropriately is causing lots of, there's lots of scary things about it, and there's lots of aspirationally uh, exciting things about it. And I think as we look at how it would impact something like Second Life, that's you know ever the more true. As you mentioned, Brett, I, I, I am one of the advisors and I was involved um, in the creation of uh, Mid Journey. And uh, one thing I would say about generative AI, about the use of AI to create art, to, to, to create new things that we've never seen before. One, one thing I would kind of start with, which I think is the obvious, is nobody's ever encountered something like this before. Um, when we all started using the internet and we started posting all of our pictures and all of our words, right, and all of our histories to websites, nobody was thinking about the idea that some, that in the future, some AI would be able to read and look at all of this information and then start synthesizing new things, which look like all of those old things, right? That that idea is completely new in human history. We've never faced a question like that. And so one thing I would say that is important to remember about Gen AI is there are no easy answers and the rules have not yet been written on this stuff. Whether, you know, journalists uh, are owed money by AIs that read their writing and how that should work is completely undefined at this point, right? Um, when AIs are able to make three-dimensional objects like the things surrounding us here in Second Life, as they soon will be able to do, what does that mean um, about things? And there's so many big arguments on each side, you know, like, of course, as human beings, we, sh we feel um, an appropriate uh, degree of uh, ownership or uh, pride about the things we create. You know, this is certainly the case and we have to keep that in mind as we figure out what to do. Um, on the other hand, there are things that the AIs can do by looking at a lot of content at once in a way that we as humans never could that might do new things for us that we'd like to do. But I would say that the court is very much still out on how this all works. I can't speak for everybody in generative AI, but for the people I know, like David, who runs Midjourney, I think many of the people I know are very respectful of what a complicated, difficult moment this is and how we need to find out the answers to all these things. And I think Second Life is one of the places where I hope 
like so many other things historically, I hope Second Life can be a, 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 a discussion point and a terrarium and an experimental tapestry for learning how some of this stuff is going to go. And I, I guess the last thing I would say is, as we all know, um, Second Life being as open as it is, is one of those weird cases where there's a degree of stuff that we can do as, well, I should say we, there's, there's a certain set of stuff that Linden Lab can do as, you know, the company that's responsible most largely for publishing the software that runs Second Life. But there's also going to be a lot of stuff that is going to happen regardless of what we want to do, or for that matter, what anybody wants to do, because, you know, um, part of what makes Second Life compelling is the fact that it's so substantially open. So, um, uh, these are tricky issues, and I'm seeing a lot of text here. Maybe we can circle back at the end and and talk more about this stuff. Yeah, it's funny. While you're talking, I've been looking at the chat locally, and it's funny. It's so polarizing. I see somebody saying, very concerned, to which somebody responded immediately thereafter, very unconcerned. So it's just <laughs> interesting to see the conversation going on. I know our creators are watching this space closely, um, everything from eager to experiment to very nervous about what it could do for existing economy and or you know, also things like attribution, of course, for artists and so forth that may or may not have trained the models, all those things, right? Yeah, I, I see somebody talking about Midjourney having the choice to train the AI, AI uh, and using artists' work without permissions. It's even more complicated than that because, for example, um, does Getty Images own the work that's been posted to Getty Images, as an example? And the answer is most certainly no. <laughs> um, things are posted to for example, sites like Getty Images all the time, which are uh, maybe things that Getty Images can or even does resell, but not necessarily things where the original artist can even convey that interest. Uh, thinking back, as, as there are many people here, we're, we've got so many artists in Second Life, Warhol uh, painting pictures of from photographs or you know pictures of, of Campbell's soup cans. He was a great explorer on this undetermined frontier around who should own collectively and individually what elements of artwork. So I, I think the thing that's interesting about AI is we've just started a big and interesting conversation as a society about how this all should work. I don't think anybody knows how it's going to net out. Um, I think it's very interesting. I think there's a tremendous risk that big companies gain an unhealthy degree of control over all this stuff. I think I would agree with, I bet a lot of people here in saying that we, we, we do have to be mindful, not just in AI, also in social media, also in politics of whether we really want to delegate the things that we're delegating to these big companies or take some of those things back for ourselves. So with that said, uh, my next question you sort of started to tap into, but we'll, we'll, we'll go deeper. Um, what's your overall take on all that's happening with AI, the good, the bad, the unknown? I mean, he, having heard what you've just said, really in your own take on it, are you optimistic or pessimistic about our AI future? Well, I have said many times that technology is neither good nor bad. I am not a person who believes that we must just press the gas pedal all the way down to the floor and welcome our robot overlords and hope that they treat us as good pets. Um, that is a ridiculously uh, utopian and, uh, you know, just nonsensical view of things. On the other hand, I don't think that technology is, it, it, similarly, I don't think that technology is a uniform evil and that we should all retreat back to an earlier time where there were no cities uh, no cars and no cell phones. So I think the answer lies um, somewhere in between. The long-term potential for AI contains many fascinating explorations and discoveries. I mean, I can't wait to be able to talk to a living thing that was not, uh, uh, you know, born of a human parent. <laughs> I, I think the excitement about being able to do that, and of course, we're, you know, we're, we're almost in the middle of it right now, and we're certainly going to be doing it in a couple of years. Uh, th th there's a fascination to that that is unbelievable. I think most of the near-term risks of AI relate to its use, its misuse by corporations. 
I think that's the big concern that I have. And then state actors as well. But I think misuse of AI by corporations or nation states is the thing that we, is very hard to predict. There is tremendous risk for us as a species and a society there. And uh, we've got to get through it. So in the long term, I think there's a lot of excitement to think about in the short term to be insensitive to the tactical risks would be very foolish. There's tremendous short-term risk and all this stuff. We're gonna circle back to AI probably as part of our con continuing conversation here, but I wanna sort of pivot a bit to uh, share with the community a little bit about what you've been up to. Um, you know, you know, there's a lot that you've been doing post SL and you continue to be involved in SL, but I don't think a lot of people are familiar with your latest venture uh, in Reality Lab. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and what the mission is? Sure. Well, In Reality Lab is a very, very informal group of people working together, both kind of co-working and then working on a bunch of projects in my new lab in San Francisco. I've been doing that for about a year. And broadly speaking, what I'm trying to do there is look at opportunities to build technology that one, draws on many of the, th the things that we've already learned in Second Life, which you know has dominated so much of my career thus far and has therefore you know, informed me the most, and is, are also ways that we can use technology to help people um, come together, trust each other, communicate, create connections, build communities, and do all the positive things that we have seen happen already in places like Second Life. I think because of Second Life, think of Second Life as like an alternative timeline, right? Doesn't it feel that way for a lot of people here? It's almost like Second Life and Facebook started at about the same time. And so you can kind of look at this like uh, timeline that of course many people here have lived very substantially in that suggests sort of where the internet could have gone in a lot of ways. like what community formation and living together and loving together and working together could have become. I think Second Life looks like kind of an alternative timeline on that. And then social media, by and large, uh, you know, in the, in the, over the last 20 years has defined what actually did happen. And there's a lot of really negative aspects of that that we're now grappling with. So I think that Second Life has been this wonderful alternative timeline. And IRL 415 is me and my friends trying to take stuff out of that timeline and make it into uh, functioning things that could help people in the, real, in, in, in the real world and in the online world learning from Second Life. Wonderful. Well, uh, in preparation for this, I looked at the website to kind of get a tease of what you're working on. <laughs> right. And there's so much to learn because there's so much teased on the site. Uh, so maybe we can drill down a little bit to the degree that you can share publicly some of the things you're working on that might shed a little bit more light sure. on things. So we'll go through, there's four of them that I pulled out. One is it says use of AI to talk to strangers. So is that like chat roulette meets Google Maps? What is that? Yeah, I mean, I'm always trying to think of positive ways to have AI help us, right? And one of the ways that is almost here, but nobody's quite deployed it yet, and I'd love to find people to help me as engineers mostly do that work. And so putting that flag up there, if you want, reach out to me about that. Um, the idea there is, yeah, what if you had something that felt a little bit like a, a, mish, a, a mashup of chat roulette and like Google Maps, right? And it let you pick a country every night somewhere far away in the world where people don't speak the same language as you. And then rather than going and visiting that country, you had a video chat with somebody, you know, randomly picked basically from that country. And the two of you got to know each other talking on a video call. But the neat thing that AI does is you both get text, text captions in wow. your original language. So you can sit and say to somebody like, hi, you're from Mongolia. Oh my God, that's so cool. Can you count to 10 for me, right? And then they count to 10 and you see you see the text come across, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, as they're saying the words. And you can then say to them, wow, you just taught me you know, how to say that. And you, you, know, you tell them how to count to 10. And so uh, I've been I thinking that. that that's a wonderful, beautiful example of a free service that ought to be out there that we should just build and put up 
and it causes people to build trust with each other, right? And that's the big thing. Like, as we all remember from the 90s, from the earliest days of the internet, and of course, from Second Life, you can totally build trust and connection with a new person online. You don't have to get in a fight with them over politics and then, you know, you know, send, send the SWAT team to their house. I mean, that, that's a very unlikely that, you know, that should, that should almost never happen. Instead, you can get along with people. So that, yeah, the, the idea of um, going on a voyage around the world and meeting new people and maybe even kind of collecting those connections with them uh, across a language barrier seems like a really, really cool thing that we can do with, with uh, AI. And you know what, we can do it first in a place like Second Life or a place like Chat Roulette, uh, then we can do it face to face because as we all know technically face to face doing translation it's just harder you know you've got to have one earpiece in or something it's it's going to be a little harder to get that working but doing it with video chat and text chat captions that all totally works today so that's a wow. that's an example of a project that we've prototyped we've got a really crappy web page that demonstrates it and i'd love to find um uh you know so you know somebody in the way of a kind of a full stack developer to help uh, bring that up and and actually get it out. But yeah, that's one. I love that. That brings people together. It's using technology for good. Um, you mentioned trust, so we'll move on to the second one from the site. Currency based on trust. This sounds fascinating. So is this a new form of currency? How does this work? Well, that's obviously a big one that I give lots of talks about, and I love to talk about Fair Share, which is that project, the currency project, is uh, really uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, it's something that uh, we started working on in the very beginning of COVID when we had the sense that were a lot of questions about what would happen as we went into the COVID crisis and uh, things like people losing their jobs started to happen and the government started uh, 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 you know, doing various things to try to help people out. And then you know, banks started loaning more money. And so there's all these questions about that. But we did a bunch of experiments with fair share and basically what fair share is is a well if you imagine what would happen tomorrow if the dollar really did just suddenly go away right like oh my god what would happen if no. the us dollar just kind of disappeared if we woke up tomorrow and there weren't any banks or something like that right no. um there'd be a lot of good in that by the way <laughs> there'd be a lot of good but but what would we actually do so the question is would we all just get like a bitcoin wallet and start buying groceries with bitcoin well and we don't have time to explain this i don't have time to explain this all right now but of course people who have grown up in second life kind of know this too uh, uh, we wouldn't actually start using bitcoin which isn't really so much like saying that bitcoin is terrible Bitcoin would definitely have a use in that world without the dollar. But what we would actually do is we would start creating local currencies. Um, local currencies in many ways, a little bit like the Linden dollar, where they are distributed and managed by the communities in a way that's different from Bitcoin. But then those communities that would create, that would start creating these little local currencies, when they need to, to travel to other communities and trade with them, um, that's the point where they would probably use some of the uh, technology that has been built with blockchain and Bitcoin and things like that. So fair share is a really cool idea that I hope we're going to get out into a smartphone app, you know, sometime later this year. It's a, it's a, it's a discord alpha test right now. Okay. Um, Fairshare.social is the site, you, you know, you can check it out there. But um, I think there is a possibility that the future of money is a, the big fiat currencies go away, a bunch of, a bunch more local currencies. I mean, if you think of the world as having what, a hundred big currencies today, imagine a world that has maybe tens of thousands of currencies rather than a hundred. And then there is some really nice protocol work that's done to enable all of those currencies to be managed locally, but then swapped with other currencies. It's a, it's a really wow. big idea and uh, one that I think is going to be a potentially a really nice tool for fighting inequality and providing people with support from their communities in a way that is uh, really difficult to do today with, with something like dollars. Can you give the URL again for the website in case people want to learn more? That one is called Fairshare, F-A-I-R-S-H-A-R-E dot social. Thank you. Excellent. Fantastic. I'm going to check it out. 
All right, next one from your site, we see uh, uh, friends in common. So I know many of us have concerns about our private contact information for all these various tools that might connect people together. How does right. this work in terms of what you're working right. on? Right, and you're absolutely, first of all, you're absolutely right about the security. And part of what we wanna do at IRL with respect to this particular problem is do something that's useful for people and has the right type of security. The way this is being done right now by big companies absolutely has the wrong type of privacy and security associated yeah. with it. But the basic idea is, and again, you know, again, shades of like walking up to another avatar in a bar in Second Life, right? But it, this is what we learned all this from, right? If you walk up to somebody who's a complete stranger to you, how do you connect with them, right? How do you establish, how, how, how would you like to get to know them, right? And I would say as a starting point, at least, there are two things about a stranger. Like imagine meeting somebody in an airport or something, right? There are two things about a stranger that you'd really like to know and that technology could actually help you uh, with. And those are, do we have friends in common? Are the, is there another person that you and I actually do both know that we can talk about right now, right? And then the second one is, do we have a group in common? Like, oh my God, we both went to the following university or we are both alumni of the following program or we are both members of some secret society, you know, that we didn't know each other were in, right? So the idea of connecting with somebody better and establishing trust is often leveraged by establishing friends in common and establishing affiliations or groups that you both share. You can do that technologically with a smartphone in a way that does not involve any centralized servers and does not create any risk of stalking or identifying you. I know that sounds weird, but for the people in the audience that are like crypto fans, Yes, wow. there is technology, there is peer-to-peer -peer technology, there is cryptographic technology that makes what I just said doable with zero risk of digital exhaust that would put you in any kind of risk. So I should be able to walk up to somebody in an airport and it should say, hey, Brett, Brett Linden is a common friend of the two of you. And we can both say, oh, cool, fantastic. How do you know Brett, you know? And so th again, this is, a, this is an example of something our phones should be doing, but are not right now, or they're doing it in a way that is not worth using because of the violations to our privacy. But this stuff can work. And you know, that, that new Apple thing where, you know, you kind of touch your phones together and they have sex and yeah. then they, they exchange contacts now, <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, I'm yeah. sure people in the audience have all tried that. I mean, it's just like a digital handshake sort yeah, of. Yeah, it's like, a, exactly, good, well put. So that digital handshake, that should be on every Android phone, every iOS phone, and you should not have to trust a company to let your information get hacked to be able to do that. And, and you should be able to do that without giving the other person your phone number or something like that, you know, something dangerous about you. You should just be able to go, hey, do we have friends in common? Bang, oh, we do. And so it turns out you can do that. And that's another project we're working on. Fantastic. Okay, one last thing from your website. Uh, it's labeled as Beyond Zoom. We've all just lived through COVID and we have, you know, arguably a new normal. Uh, and many of us, of course, survived the Zoom situation where suddenly for those of us working in the nine to five, we found ourselves on Zoom constantly, right? It, obviously yeah. we're evolving past that. So what does Beyond Zoom mean exactly in the context of your, your work? Well, let me back up and even scope that out a little bit since we're here with everybody in Second Life because it's such a good conversation with, with our bigger family here. Um, here's what I think about, and I know this, I'm going to say something controversial so everybody can kind of come at me about this. And I know, I know it's a, it's, a, it's a controversial statement, but having had like more than 10 years now to sort of say it over and over again and debate it with people and come back to it, I'm pretty confident about it. And it, it's this, why aren't people using avatars like why aren't people doing things like second life but billions of people you know not uh not just millions of people and i've come to believe over the years more than anything else that the reason isn't the frame rate <laughs> it isn't the complicated ui um it isn't the lack of pbr um it isn't uh, it isn't even, although I think this is a problem, it isn't even the ability to get lots of people in the same place. We're actually doing a somewhat better demonstration of that right now, right? Where I think we've probably got, I don't know, several hundred people uh, sitting right here. I just took a beautiful picture of everybody and put it on Twitter. Um, I think that uh, 
the biggest problem why people aren't in places like Second Life is because communication when you're standing face to face with somebody as an avatar has two aspects to it. Um, one is the direct communication, which is typically in the form of text or audio. The second one is all the nonverbal information, right? Your, your, our avatars are sitting on stage right now, but are they gesturing at each other? Are they doing what I'm doing with my hand right now while I'm talking? Am I able to look into your eyes, Brett, and establish con and, and have you confidently know that I heard your last question? Am I able to look at the person in the front row of the audience there and have a connection with them while I'm talking, right? As a means of kind of, uh, you know, rebasing myself to what's going on in the room. No, we're not able to do that. Um, Nonverbal communication is not conveyed in Second Life as completely as the great majority of people need for them to feel safe communicating with other people. And, and this gets back to the Beyond Zoom, it's not true in Zoom either, is it? <laughs> when, when there are more than two people on a Zoom call, as we all know, there's a terrible lack of nonverbal communication. You don't know who's looking at who, who's surprised, whether somebody's paying attention to you or not, or just looking at their screen. All of that nonverbal information is also lost in group meetings in Zoom. So given that so much of communication is nonverbal and that, and that it makes people so uncomfortable to not get that information, uh, we've got to do something to make people comfortable communicating online face to face in groups of more than two people. And that's what I call as that, that's what I say that project is. Second Life has been a tremendous exploration of different ways of doing that, but it hasn't worked for everybody. And in fact, it doesn't work for most people. Um, and I think there are ways to kind of uh, combine the ideas and the ways we use avatars and the ways we use 3D with what we do when we're on a video call to come up with something that 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 looks better and that we where we can we can give people a way of communicating in groups that includes nonverbal information and feels really great. So that is one of my favorite topics and it's a delight to get to, you know, sit here with everybody and, and listen. I'm trying to read trying to read all the text flying by on this one. Yeah, it's flying by. I've been trying to catch up on it myself as well. Um, well, let's circle back to Second Life. So certainly there are questions coming in from the community because people know you so well with Second mm -hmm. Life. And I know you get asked this all the time, but we've got to ask it. Here we are at the Second Life 21st birthday. Unbelievable 21 years. Um, did you ever imagine 20 plus years ago that we would have this conversation today, that Second Life would still be going strong two decades later? It's funny. I remember somebody on a, I was on a press tour in 2006 and somebody on the press tour, a journalist, you know, this just was right when Second Life took off. And he asked me uh, face to face, he said, when you started Second Life, did you think that it would work? <laughs> and I remember I said, well, first of all, did I think that people would someday live together in virtual worlds as avatars. I told him I, I was and have always been completely sure that that would be true, that that would, that would someday come to pass. <laughs> what I then said to him was, I was much less sure that myself, my friends, the group of people we were working with, with the amount of money that we had with the technology at the time, you know, circa 2003, say, I was much less sure that we would be successful in making that happen with Second Life at that time. And so I guess two answers to you there. One, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, I knew the world was going this way and voila, here we are, right? 20 years later, you know, we are, we are uh, slowly but surely, you know, finding ways to find ourselves in virtual worlds. Um, that said, it's been a long road and the technology to enable it has been very difficult. And in many ways, I feel like it's humbling to have spent my entire career, pretty much, but between High Fidelity and Second Life, on trying to make avatars work for everyone and failing in a lot of ways. And I think that's, uh, you know, ask me on a different day how I feel about it, right? Some days it's frustrating and some days it's humbling and some days it's kind of inspiring and 
Some days it's sad. I don't know. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll have at least another 21 years and more than that with Second Life. Um, we had know. a pretty important milestone this week, Philip. I'm sure you've been following the news um, with our mobile app. And it's been in development, you know, stop and start over the years. But we really kicked into high gear with development over the past couple of years. And yeah. I think it was just a day or two ago that we actually put it officially on the uh, both the Apple and Android stores. It is still in beta. It's still got a long way to go. It is currently for premium and premium plus, but will soon be available to everybody. Curious if you've had a chance to check it out yet and what are your thoughts about the mobile app? And also what, if anything, do you think is important about mobile in terms of the future for Second Life? Well, I have had a chance to check it out. I was on it just a, like a half an hour ago testing. Um, I have been, I think I chatted. I don't know if they're, they're here. I, I remember running around a few months ago, actually, with a very early build and actually running into a, a couple and hanging out in their place and chatting with them um, with the with the mobile uh, test flight viewer. And it was so much fun. Um, so uh, without question, we've got to bring Second Life onto mobile from so many different potential directions, right? As a, as a way of, as a, as a way of people just taking as a way of people that are already in Second Life, just using mobile in a reasonable way, the way they do with it, the way they use mobile for, you know, banking and communication and so many other things in our lives right now. Um, I think there's a harder question, which is, can the experience of being in a virtual world like this be translated onto the little black mirror? Um, I, I, I think that's hard, right? But we are doing some nice work on that. I mean, I think the the, the progress looks pretty good. I, I, I've been using it. I've, I'm trying to get my direct messages coming in, you know, kind of helping, you know, debug that with the team. But um, it feels like it's uh, it feels like it's working. It's obviously not widely enough available yet, so that you know it it can, you know, it it, it can really get out there. But I'm super excited to see it come into that first public beta. Yeah, we're eager to get it open to everybody, and that will come soon. We haven't announced the date yet, but we're working as fast as we can uh, to make it available for everybody. Uh, like I said, if you're premium or premium plus, and you're in the audience, you can actually tr check it out right now, and uh, everyone else uh, will have access to it shortly as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, we get a lot of questions, Philip, um, asking about your current affiliation. Uh, obviously, people know you as the uh, founder of Linden Lab and, you know, sort of the forefather of, of Second Life, et cetera. But really, they want to know, are you still involved? And if so, what is your capacity? Maybe you can kind of clear the air a little bit about what your current role is. And do you still log in regularly to Second Life, even if it's on the download through an alt? <laughs> well, I must say that I've, I, I, I have had a couple of... Um... I guess what we'd call alt accounts, although I think one of my alt accounts is called Philip Rosedale, so I don't know if that's very alt but- um, <laughs> You're not going to fool anybody with that. Yeah, exactly. It's not going to, subterfuge is not going to work too well there. Um, it's funny, I've never used alt accounts. I, I could imagine doing it in the future. I, 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 I think I should in a way, because it would give me a view of the world that would be very peaceful and original. And I, I don't know why I haven't done that yet. I do go in world as myself, Philip Linden, um, from time to time. And I enjoy that. I sometimes take people on tours, you know, I'll, I'll have a friend over or something and I'll want to show them what Second Life is is like, you know, and so I'll take them on a, a little tour. Um, so I do, I do log in, but not as much as I would like to. Um, I, uh, I've got my, my P squared Island people. Should we sometimes do events on, we had a nice discussion regarding uh, fair share and uh, basic income and Bitcoin and stuff the other day. That was a lot of fun. Actually, we had a nice full crowd on my, my Island uh, uh, to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I still am. And then, and then with respect to my role, Brett, I am the founder obviously, but more recently um, I am an advisor to the company and I regularly have conversations with uh, different teams about things like trying out the mobile viewer, for example, or my thoughts on, you know, how AI and, and Second Life might interact. Um, so I have, I have a small amount of advisory work that I do with the team. I do not have a full-time day-to-day uh, role in the company right now. So hopefully that's helpful. Well, we're so grateful to have your wisdom. Obviously you've been such a pioneer in terms of getting us off the ground. And as we say frequently in all the media interviews, like Second Life has been really at the forefront 
of even the idea of virtual economies, communities, and you know all of this. So um, thank you really for all of your you know contributions to Second Life. We're glad to still have you in the mix. Um, so on that note, we have a question that comes from a community member. Um, sure. It says, has there ever been a moment when you realize really on just a deep like human level, uh, how Second Life has had the power to transcend to really beyond just entertainment. I mean, thinking about the earliest days when you were envisioning what Second Life would be, did you ever imagine sort of the human level impact that it's had? Because we hear stories all the time from people saying, you know, they met their husband or wife or significant other, you know, um, it changed their life in some way. I'm sure you must hear those stories. Um, what is that like for you to hear those stories? And, and did you ever imagine that that would be the case? Well, let me answer that by reminding everybody the, the two different ways that I fell in love with Second Life and before Second Life even existed with the idea of it, right? The first way was that I wanted to see a living organic world. So the first dream of Second Life was of a huge primeval garden that Andrew and I talked about where we would assemble tens of thousands of machines together in some sort of crazy SETI style computing network, right? And that what, instead of looking for aliens in the radio signals, we would get those computers to um, simulate the laws of physics so well that living things would spring forth, you know, from the simulation and that we would be able to wander through this primeval garden and find creatures that had emerged, you know, from the basic rules and talk to them or whatever, or, or chase them around or whatever, you know, or have them eat us. <laughs> so that idea of an, a new world that, that emerged, you know, like a planet or something, you know, from a basic set of rules, that was the first thing that I fell in love with. That was the thing that when I was a little kid, I used to dream about at night. I used to dream about what it would be like to, to see a world being born atop a new kind of laws of physics. Like, like the question said, as people began using Second Life and making it their home, um, I, I became amazed and fascinated and affected myself by the way that being together in a virtual world, whether or not it was alive, affected us as human beings. So I started to see, as I said earlier, I started to see people uh, falling in love with each other in Second Life that, uh, that would have never had a chance to fall in love with each other in the real world, you know? Or people working together, you know, where the two people that were working together, building something, maybe making money doing it, were in like two countries in the world where they just, they would never have had a chance to do that. You know, maybe they didn't share a language. They certainly didn't share a currency. They didn't share a legal system, right? They didn't share geography. So the impact that it had on human beings in bringing them together and in allowing them to peaceably make things together, that that then became my second love was, was th the effect that virtual worlds had on people, right? And I'm still torn between those two things. If you find me on a given day here in San Francisco, you might find me talking more about one or the other. The conversation about AI to some extent is related to both. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a new form of life that we can create now. But the impact on human life is what I speak to with the work on fair share, for example, you know, where we're trying to use, we're trying to do something pretty prosaic to do something with technology that vastly, that, that could vastly improve people's relations with each other in the real world. So that's how i would answer that these two loves yeah. a love of a love of creation and then a love of how people are how people can be helped to come together in these worlds you know i'm wondering if there's a specific story that you'd be comfortable sharing i know i've heard you in previous talks mention that you've been at events or conferences and somebody will come up to you and say you know what second life meant to them have you heard one particular story that stands out for you that really was moving for you or a mo like an aha moment to the impact that second life has had culturally and or for an individual you know i i've, I've had many experiences like that one that comes to mind though was um i was asked to give a talk at a school in Saudi Arabia at a school called Kaust some time ago. And never having been to Saudi Arabia, 
uh, this was maybe a decade or more ago, I, I eagerly said, yeah, I'll, I, I'd like to go to a college there and kind of just see what's what, you know, try to understand a world that I know so little about. And uh, I gave several talks and, and group meetings when I was there, and I don't remember which one of them it was, but I remember a woman walking up to me in a burqa and not, not all the students had, within the school, not all of the students wore the full uh, burqa. Um, so, so this was particularly kind of um, striking. And, and she came up to me and I don't remember whether she kind of fist bumped me or, or just gave me a nod, but you know, it was one of those moments where that was kind of all she needed to say. Yeah. And I knew, you know, that, that she was saying thank you for this yeah. thing, you know, that has given me so much freedom. Yeah. So that's one that I just, you know, really. And you think really about fun. that. I mean, that's just got to be amazing for, for that individual and, and other people yeah. who all, also have had similar experiences of freedom of expression or things that maybe, I mean, not to assume anything, but maybe in their culture or in yeah. their personal lives. They're unable to uh, express themselves in a particular kind of way. Um, yeah, and, I mean, as we all know, we all came here for big reasons, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's something that's really amazing, right? I mean, I bet everybody here can think of a big reason why they're here, right? And of course, in a commercial software, make a lot of money, get a billion people using it. That's a problem, right? Because you know, you gotta you gotta build things where people didn't need some immense reason to use those things, but we all have those immense reasons and that was hers. And I think, uh, you know, so I think, yeah, a repressive regime is a big reason. And it's one of the examples of, you know, why we might find someone in second life. And so, yeah, I, I find those stories, uh, really inspiring. I mean, that, that really moved me. Thank you for sharing that. I think that the community is responding quite with their own stories I'm seeing in chat, but it's, that's really very powerful. Um, we've got a question from the community asking about sort of the longer term future of Second Life um, and your vision and how it continues with Second Life. Um, so what is your vision for Second Life for the next, say, 10 years? Where do you ultimately see or would like to see, rather, uh, Second Life go or improving? Well, first of all, going back to what we said earlier and what I was saying about nonverbal communication, these problems are going to get solved. We all know that particularly this problem of making more and more expressive avatars is going to get solved. The work that's being done in AI right now is enabling, um, one of the ways of using AI, right, is to allow it to discern and understand and predict things about you from, say, looking at your face, right? Um, well, you can, you can think about how all the kind of you know nefarious ways that we're using that with deep fakes and stuff but imagine how modern ai is going to be able to be used to look at us with cameras and then make our avatars act like us right emote like us so in 10 years i think not with vr headsets by the way it might be farther out i don't think we're going to be able to do this in 10 years with vr headsets i know mm -hmm. come at me about that but i think that in 10 years on a screen, like on a laptop or a, a, a mobile phone or whatever, we, whatever we're using the most in 10 years, I think it's very likely that we'll be able to be, uh, to be an avatar in a way that finally gets past that uncanny moment and feels safe and communicative and powerful to virtually everyone. And once we get to there, our little party here is going to become something that everybody uses at least once in a while. By the way, as I've gotten older and wiser, I don't think we should, I don't think you should necessarily, everyone, you know, should dive into virtual worlds to the exclusion of the real world. I don't think that's true. I, I think a younger me probably thought that was a little bit true or kind of hoped it was. But I think that everybody will make use of virtual worlds at least a little in another 10 years. And that is going to be a really exciting thing to see happen. And when it does, hopefully it's something that we're a big part of. Um, but we're all going to know, I mean, that, that's going to be pretty exciting, right? I mean, I think a lot of people here in the audience and myself included thought that that would happen in the like 2011, 12 timeframe, right? We thought it would happen like really soon. We thought that 
things like Second Life worked well enough to get everybody in here, but it, they don't, they didn't, and they don't yet. But I do think that's going to happen. So in 10 years, I would say the real dream of a whole, rich, uh, general purpose online world that Second Life has been telling the story of for so long is going to be something that is one way or another uh, going to become a, you know, everyone kind of a phenomena. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Somebody wrote soon TM. I love it. Yes, totally. I love that. Yeah, that's great. I'm not even. I'm not gonna. Well, I guess I did call the ball there a little bit on the ten years. I, I hope I'm not being an Elon in my predictions, but <laughs> I, I do. I do think that there's only software keeps us from better projection of ourselves into avatars at this point, not hardware. So that's why I would defend that ten year idea, right? Because look at the power we've got with GPUs now, right? I mean, there's just you know, the general purpose machine learning stuff against GPUs, even on phones, is so powerful now that I think we're going to be able to wiggle our noses and wink at somebody. Or I always say the acid test is we should we should be able to have two avatars that are absolutely not our real selves, like any two avatars in the audience here. But if we are if we have those two avatars talking to each other on video like we're doing right now, and you turn the audio off those avatars re friends should be able to immediately recognize them from their facial expressions and their body movements. That's the, yeah. that's the sort of acid test. And I'm just telling you, I think in 10 years, we're going to be there. Fascinating. All right. We have an interesting question that comes from the community. This is a pre submitted question. Uh, they really is a question about your vision for virtual property rights. They ask as in real life, why not allow residents to have a relative or close friend inherit your property, including your house, inventory, land, money, or even a donation. What are your thoughts about that? Wow, that's a great one. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, Brett, and I'll demonstrate my advisorship here. I'm not sure what our policies are on that right now. And Honestly, I, yeah, it's, I, I, I we'd don't have know. to go patch and um, find out, I guess. Do we not do do we allow so let me back up and say hey i don't know what our policy is and so i feel <laughs> kind of dumb in front yeah. of everybody but hey i'm an advisor um b b let me take this opportunity to allude to kind of what i talked about with fair share which is an economic system yeah the idea of generating generational wealth through inheritance is one that i'm just going to say personally i think is deeply problematic um we are at a level of inequality in the United States, for example, that in my opinion is utterly unsustainable. I believe that on both the left and the right, there is equal uh, responsibility for aiding and abetting a situation of wealth inequality in the United States, which is utterly unsustainable. I know that's debatable, and I know lots of people here would love to debate it, and actually I do love debating it with people, but I'm, I'm on the side of that being unacceptable. Transferring tax-free your wealth to your children is yet another example of how we got there. Um, the United States has always been a place of equal opportunity, or, or it has at least idealistically been that. I should let me be respectful and say I know perfectly well that it is not that, especially not today. But we as Americans, many of us aspire to have created and we dream that we lived in or live in a world where there is an unusual degree of mobility and freedom and opportunity for everybody. And we need to really stick with that. That's a great, that's a wonderful idea. And it's a place that we can get to uh, as a world. So inheriting your stuff at the level of generational wealth, I think is politically problematic. Um, I mean, it's just, it's not something we should be, it's, it's one of the examples of how we're hurting ourselves. However, I don't think that's what the community member was probably asking. I, I should say we should take it under advisement or it's a good question as to, are we doing everything that makes the most sense to everybody about what happens with inheritance? Um, if it, that's a good question. I don't know what we do. And actually but, somebody, while you were answering, uh, secretly passed me the URL to our wiki policy on it, which I have posted in chat. For others so not to put you on the spot but that was great for to get your take on it we have now the official policy uh mentioned there as well oh, um, yeah, some, yeah, some, some good insights it looks like some thoughts have been given to that um okay so resident able i hope getting the name right able Fay asks if there were no constraints or of tech or finances 
what would be a pet project that you'd love to see come to Second Life in the next few years? If the sky's the limit, what would it be? Well, we've already talked about this kind of making your avatars really, really expressive. And so I'll just, I'll, I'll give you a different one. The quote that is most associated with me, I bet people could, I, I would ask people type it, type in the chat what the quote was that, you know, what, what's the number one Philip Linden quote, right? And then I think the number one quote, we'll see if people are typing here, but the number one quote that I think has been associated with me is, um, quote, I'm not building a game, I'm building a new country, end quote. Um, I don't remember when I said that, I think it was first quoted in like a Wired article or something in 2006, but that idea of using Second Life as a gathering place and a playground for building new kinds of countries, that's something that I'd like to see happen. We have such a rich world here, we can very easily prototype things like basic income or ranked choice voting or how to handle immigration in a community. Um, there are so many things that we can do in a virtual world and provide uh, proof and exploration and uh, research on what we should do with our own real world systems. And I'd like to go back to that. I'd like to see, my pet project would be to see Second Life genuinely be useful in prototyping new types of nation states. You know, there's there's been a very uh, uh, contentious author who, who, who wrote a book that I think was called like The Network State, I think. Mm. And that's a very polarizing book because I think it, it starts with a stack of ideas, but then it makes some kind of assumptions on top of that stack that many of us, myself included, do not agree with in terms of, you know, what the purpose or outcomes would be. But the baseline of that, that he, the, the basic statement he makes is, which of course we in Second Life have been making for a long time is, hey people, um, if we want to create a new country, let's just do it. I mean, w w why couldn't you use network communication to create affiliations between people that would start to uh, edge into the realm of how countries are made? So that's 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 the pet project really broadly that I have tweeted about a few times, and I'm uh, planning and scheming, uh, uh, you know, as to how we could better uh, use Second Life for that. And I think of that not as a that's much more of a community thing than it is a a Linden Lab thing. So I guess it's not really a if money were no object thing. It doesn't really require any money at all. But I'd I'd like to see. I'd like to see a new country form in Second Life and 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 explore what that would be like. I was just at an event a couple of weeks ago up here in uh, Napa Valley in Healdsburg. Some folks here probably know about it. That was called Edge Esmeralda. And it was a pop-up city, if you will. And so it was an attempt to bring a bunch of modern, a, a bunch of current thinkers together and have some big discussions about how you might be able to form a new country, a new government, a new economy, a new society. Um, and it was being done as this pop-up city in Napa Valley. But I, I, I go to something like that and I had a ton of fun. It was great to be there, but it makes me think like, wait a second, we can do that in Second Life. Uh, you know, we, we could start a new country in Second Life. Why, why don't we? Okay, well, that's an example. We've covered a lot of your sort of entrepreneurial past and ambitions um, for Second Life and even beyond and outside of Second Life. Uh, are there any other areas we've not covered yet that you're still interested in exploring and want to share with the audience? Uh, you know, things that might uh, be areas that we've not discussed yet. We've talked about AI and all sorts of things. What else is on your mind as far as areas that you'd like to explore or are actively exploring? Uh I think we've covered a lot of them. I mean, a lot of yes. them. My problem is always, as a as an individual, is, is just I I try to work on too many things. You know, I, I know there's so many people in the audience that are creative like I am and know that feeling. But uh, <laughs> my my problem is getting excited about too many too many uh, ideas at once, and then and then not giving any of them enough of my time. So I think it's always uh, 
uh, uh, trying to focus. Gosh, as you get older too, it, it just gets that, 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 that focusing problem actually gets worse, not better. Sorry, folks. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I, I think we've, I think we've touched on a lot of the, uh, uh, a, a lot of the areas that I'm, that I'm thinking about. Yeah, you've got a lot going on there. Um, we're, I'm looking through the stream of questions that have come in. Yeah. I think we've run through the pre-submitted ones. So I'm going to sort of cherry pick out questions. Sure. Apologies to people in advance. If we don't get to your question. Obviously we're keeping an eye on time as well, but we'll pull out a few here that might be interesting to add topics that we've not discussed yet. So one that comes from the community goes way back to your rig device, which I'm sure many people know mm -hmm. about. Um, they, uh, somebody says, how is progress on the rig device going? They've been watching several recent YouTube. Is there new progress on the rig? What's going on with that? <laughs> yeah. So if you go to, uh, if you go to my Substack, I think Philip about Substack, you'll see a, uh, posting that I put on there about the rig, which I think I called motionless VR. Did I think I called it that? Um, if you if you look up my Substack and you know read all my stuff and subscribe and whatnot, uh, you'll you'll find it. But yeah, we resurrected a machine called the Rig that we built in the very first year of Second Life. Before, for the most part, we started working on the software that would become Second Life, and it was a machine that is very appropriate right now, given what a tough slog VR has been, and with you know perhaps most recently the uh, kind of negative news in general, I think, on stuff like the Vision Pro, where it looks like maybe maybe Apple's even slowing down a little bit on their enthusiasm with VR devices. Uh, the rig is this weird idea that you, uh, rather than letting somebody move around and trip over their cat and stuff uh, in the real world while wearing a face toaster, you know, uh, to let them see the virtual world, you instead do a very different thing, which was this weird idea that I had years before I started Second Life, and it became our first patent that we wrote as a company, which is now expired, so you're free to use it. But it was this idea that rather than putting people in a headset, what if we immobilized people? What if we actually had you kind of hold on to or sort of bolted you into something that basically didn't let you move, you know, kind of held you still, uh, you know, God forbid, not like uh, Malcolm and uh, Clockwork Orange, but, you know, y what if you were sort of, resting against a machine that didn't let you move. And then when you tried to say, turn your head to the left and right, or lift your arm up, the uh, force that you put on this machine that you're kind of laying on was detected and used to move your view or your avatar's arm in exactly that way. So it's this very unusual idea that if we immobilize you completely, we might be able to free you to become an avatar. And of course, for example, for people that are disabled, that might be especially compelling because it might be something that's accessible to them that you know traditional VR hard devices wouldn't be. So that was, again, one of the very first lab experiments we did. And if you look at my Substack, you can read more about it, but it's a very weird idea. It delights me to work on crazy stuff like that. Not at all clear how we would uh, turn that into a uh, real product because it's quite a, uh, quite, quite, a, quite a crazy idea. But yeah, that, that's one of our fun experiments. Yeah, somebody dug out sketches of the original rig and I think they made their way onto the internet. It might've been on New World Notes or something, but um, it was kind of interesting to see from a historical perspective that and of course where it's gone since. Um, so it's floating around there on the internet somewhere for people that want to do yeah, it. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to find the link and stick it in the, in the chat here. But yeah, it's, it's, that was a lot of fun. Here's an interesting question for you, kind of a fun one. Somebody asks, uh, Philip, are, is, uh, are you avatar number one or did another development beat you to it? <laughs> I saw that question <laughs> and uh, I loved it. I believe, Lyndon's can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that it was Andrew who beat me to it and maybe even a couple of other people. I think it was one of those things we chuckled about at the time that I am not in fact, you know, GUID 0000. I, I, I think I'm like 0004 or something like that. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure Andrew got in there before me and I'm not sure who else did, but I'm not the first avatar. I wasn't that vain. Um, uh, it, it was, it was, it was, it was somebody else. I, I, 
Stellar, I, I see, I'm seeing the chatter. Stellar was the first non-Linden maybe. She was plus or minus the first couple of people. I, I Sometimes people will get after me on that too. I'm not completely sure, but Stellar was definitely our first like kind of super uh active and you know well it, it, she she was such a memorable uh character and and she was one of the very very first non-linden accounts but amongst the lindens i think i was beaten by like two or three people one of whom was andrew <laughs> fantastic all right so here's an interesting question someone asked i'm sort of uh editorializing the the original wording though somebody is referencing the fact that we've had brands from a historical perspective i remember the early days of second life where second life was on the cover of magazines it was on the office and csi and brands came in and then they left and then we did a little bit with the met with the metaverse hype cycle uh we just did a motown thing a year ago so i'm i'm curious from your perspective having seen it all the ups and the downs of it where do you think the role is for brands and or entertainment companies in the metaverse um, or for Second Life specifically or as a whole? I, do you think that that's a waste of time or that there is actually value there if done right? What are your thoughts as you see all these things happening? Yeah, yeah like you said, it's been really interesting to watch brands and personal creativity or, you know, you know, brands and individuals sort of interact in all these other virtual worlds as well. I think there's been similar problems, right? I think there's been a tension and a conflict where if you are kind of leaning back in your chair and just trying to, you know, beat your neighbors to buying your Gucci accessories or whatever in the next virtual world, just like you did in the real world, there's a kind of a staleness to that that I think we can all feel. So I think what's happened with brands has reiterated some of the same tensions that we saw in the early days of Second Life as well, which is not to say that there's not room for everything there is, but I'm going to just, again, to be controversial and to just take a side and not be wishy-washy about it, I still think you have to start with individual, you, you have to dramatically and substantially start with the new things that we all create together as individuals before you get to brands. That that that's my take on it. And I, I'm just going to say I don't think any, I don't think any compelling, useful, positive virtual world could be built entirely around existing brands. I just I think that's just going to be a very bland fail, and also potentially harmful. You know the 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 overreach of brands and copyright holders and stuff has which has been written you know far more eloquently than folks than, than myself by folks like Cory Doctorow, for example, who, by the way, was here for a book signing a few months back. I'm sure others here saw that. I was there. I was a total fanboy moment. I was like, I can't believe I'm sitting next to Cory Doctorow. Um, but yeah, he's yeah. in the book club that we've had. Uh, Drax does that. And yep, yep, he's got some great it. authors. And too. Was great. Yeah. And I've, I've gotten a chance to spend a little more time with he and his, his, his co-author on uh, uh, Choke Point Capitalism. But um, he, he's, he's just, you know, he's an amazing thinker who's really got his finger on some of the things that we've just got to all be thinking about right now. But anyway, yeah, brands, brands are, you know, they're, they're part of the tapestry of creativity that we exhibit as a species. And so they belong there in that regard, but I don't think they, they should be primal and I don't think they should be preferred. So Vic Mornington asks, you could go if you could go back to the transition from Linden World to Second Life and change just one thing, what would you change and why? Huh. Yeah, Linden World was a tiny little <laughs> village, like a little, it was a little town square. It was so cool looking. Um it was incredibly quaint. You know, it felt like it felt like you know, Andy Griffith or something compared to the beautiful uh, amazingness of Second Life that came after it. Um, I don't, I don't think I would do anything that differently. You know, you know what I what I would say in answer to that though was, how many people here remember the tax revolt? <laughs> there's probably oh there's got to be still a couple of people here. You're going to go there, Philip. Huh? I, I think for copies <laughs> out there, I think there are people out there in the audience that remember the, the tax revolt. But by the way, if anybody has links or images from that time, please send them to me or send them to Brett. I, I, I can't find uh, some of that stuff. But, you know, I bring that up because creating a balance uh, 
but creating a balance in the system that helped people create content in respect for the resources that were available on a server in an area, et cetera, was something that we totally screwed up how we did it. And it was my fault. I think I actually probably wrote a bunch of that code back then, which was this idea of um, the tax revolt, for those who don't know, which is just a ton of fun, was that we were giving everybody a Linden dollars, just like we do today. But then what we did was whatever stuff you had built and put down on the ground, we basically taxed you on every week. So if you had, you know, put a bunch of cubes on the ground somewhere, depending on even, even if it wasn't on your property, you would, you would basically pay a small Linden dollar, like property tax every week on that content. Now you can imagine the good side of that, the good idea there was that it's a fair way of balancing resources between everybody so that, you know, you can't just put up a hundred thousand blinking lights or, you know, 8k textures on everything you have. And then your neighbor gets basically no, no CPU time from the server. It was a good idea in that respect that we're trying to fix that. It was a bad idea in that it was completely confusing and impossible to estimate like what your tax bill was going to be. And so everybody revolted and turned it into a tea party and rebelled against the government, which of course was totally fun and funny and appropriate. And so we shut it all down. But yeah, yeah, born free tax to death, I see from, uh, from Hikaru. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that was, the, that was the, the gist of it. So I, I think I would go back and I would do that right with the community, you know, with the time to design it correctly with everybody's help. Because I think taxes are one of those things that you do need as a community. We've just appropriately come to hate them so much because they're always associated with, you know, evil things that are happening to us in other ways. And I, I get that. But if you want to create a stable virtual world where everybody can share the resources in the best possible way for everybody's collective welfare, taxation is a part of that, just not the way we did it in 2002 or whatever. So here's an interesting question, a little unusual, that comes from Jack Jones 100. Okay. Is a virtual AI population possible, indistinguishable from humans, replicants, and residents? In other words, do androids dream of Linden sheep? <laughs> right. I mean, I have this weird feeling that I don't know how this will compare to something like Second Life, but I have this weird feeling that one of the most amazing uh, uses of virtual worlds is not for us, but as a safe place for, for AIs to grow up together. So, you know, AIs, one of the reasons why AIs are not living things yet, right, is that they do not yet have a home. They do not live in a place. They are not embodied in a place. And I, for one, and there's lots of good philosophers that write more eloquently than I about this, am of the belief that living things are contingent on living environments. You cannot isolate a living thing from its environment and its resources. For that reason, I believe that A, we don't have living things among us today with AI because AIs do not as yet live embodied in a world. But, and then of course, some people would say, well, we'll just make them into robots and put them in the real world. Well, be careful what you wish for, for heaven's sakes, right? I mean, cause that's a lot of Black Mirror episodes and, uh, you know, trying to say, make AIs in robot bodies and then conscript them to be less than human and do our bidding is an outrageous, ethically horrible um, and likely to end very badly as the movies have shown us uh, idea. Instead, what we ought to be doing is not putting AIs into robot bodies, but putting AIs into a place like Second Life where they can live and enjoy safety and security and a separation from us as human beings uh, on their own there. So yes, I think there's a future for AIs in virtual worlds. I don't know to what extent we're part of that future. Um, that is how we can respectfully create an interface between humans and those AIs. But I, I have actually a high degree of predictive confidence that an AI grid of some kind, thank you, Loki, uh, is what we're going to see. Um, uh, I'd love to see it happen in second with, with something like Second Life, but I think it's actually an existential um, opportunity for us to, to, to do that the right way, as opposed to how what we're doing with LLMs and stuff right now. Thank you, Philip. I want to acknowledge to uh, the community 
uh, we have a lot of questions that are probably directed to our next round table uh, where the product owners or the teams will can speak to them. Uh, but for Philip, we've got a couple more left and then I think we're running close to the end of our time. So I'm gonna pull out two or three more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, this was an anonymous question that comes in. Uh, speaking to your sort of uh, incognito presence in SL, if you have alts, for example, if you needed to create an alt today to be super incognito, what would it be? A furry, a pony, or a boring human? <laughs> You're leading me. A boring human. <laughs> Come on. I, I've been a boring human from the very beginning. That's Philip Linden. Um... <laughs> I don't know. I don't they, they know. They want you to reveal your, your secret identity, perhaps. I don't know. I, I got to get out there and explore and see what form I would care to have. Um, I love the animism of all the wonderful avatars that we've made, right? I love the idea that every avatar that's non-human breathes life, reminds us that the universe is more mysterious than we think it is. And uh, that you know, life can be in everything, and that there can be you know, you know, being coming from everything. So, I don't know where I would land. I think I would try a lot of these different identities and see how they fit me. I do think that um, the uncanny valley of human likenesses trying to be just like themselves and then better animated in virtual worlds has been largely a a fail. You know, it's been an incredibly hard problem. So, I think practically speaking, uh, being a furry, for example, is a way more sensible near-term idea for projecting a uh, uh, pro projecting a hum human, believable, compelling sort of um, nonverbal communication onto an avatar. I don't know. I think that's a that's a good question. Hey, can I take one from the list here that I saw? Yeah, on? please. Somebody somebody said, "Is it true that <laughs> Philip and Michael Linden wanted to move Linden Lab onto a San Francisco Bay?" ferry boat and the well, is answer it is yes it is that oh was th th there is there is an old icebreaker that's in the san francisco bay now that proves that i'm not that insane there was a a guy even crazier than me that managed to get an old icebreaker and turn it into a kind of a uh oh it's it's a it's a it's a thing of san francisco history now but it's been a, this this amazing boat that people have had parties on and stuff for the last uh, few years yeah, I I thought the only thing that stopped us was fiber optic cables. I wow. I think it, Michael Linden told me that there was a I think there was a ferry boat in Seattle. <laughs> and the idea that we had was we would buy this cheap cheap ferry boat and it was cheap. It was practically free. And the only thing we had to do was get that sucker down to the bay area, you know, by way of water, which, you know, that may well have been the probably the end of the first few ferry boats if we had tried it. But our idea was to get this old Seattle ferry boat, bring it down into the San Francisco Bay, tie it up to one of the harbors, and then move the whole office into the boat. And the thing that made it not viable was the idea of, uh, well, I should back up and say, at that time, we owned all our own servers. So we were fancying, we were imagining having the servers on the boat as well, right? Wow. <laughs> and the idea of snaking fiber optic cables all, you know, cyberpunk off the end of the boat and to the dock. Yeah, that was a bridge too far even for me. Um, we, we, we figured that wasn't going to work out too well. Oh, my God. But yes, right, indeed, we love that idea. <laughs> one last question. This is another historical one. So we'll wrap up on this one. Uh, Full Perm Alpha says or asks, how was the idea behind using the surname Linden uh, how did you come up with Lyndon as a surname? Where did that come from? Right, right, right. Well, the, the easy answer is Lyndon is the name of an alley in Hayes Valley, San Francisco. You can look it up on the map. The original, uh, the original address of Lyndon Lab was 333 Lyndon Alley, which you could, or Lyndon Street, thank you. Um, yeah, some people call it alley. It, it, it basically was, a, was an alley. It was a very narrow street. But um, 333 Linden. Today, it is an optometry, uh, 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 like a glasses slash optometry place. You can walk in there. I have walked in there and I was so delighted because the proprietor who currently has that place said, wait a second, are you Philip Rosedale? This thing's <laughs> on a famous garages of Silicon Valley list. And I was so amazed. I couldn't believe that we had made it onto that. But uh, apparently, uh, Second Life, 
Second Life's birthplace is known as a famous uh, garage, if you will. It was really a warehouse, but that is where the surname Linden came from, was the company's name, Linden Lab. And that came from the street name. Andrew and I moved in there first, and we were just like, well, that's an easy one. I was like, Linden, I like this. Let's just call it Linden Lab. Lab, not labs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We get that that mistake all the time, the, the plural there. So that's the origin story there for the uh, for the name of Linden Labs. Right. That's right. And, the and hey, yeah. by the way, Hayes Valley today, we're, we're Lin and, and it was a very different Hayes Valley when, when we started the company in 1999. But Hayes Valley today is the hotbed, as many of you know. It's called Cerebral Valley now is the nickname mm -hmm. for it. And it's where all the AI companies are. So it's kind of, I think it's kind of fun that, you know, uh, uh, 20 years later, uh, the, the, the excitement is back in Hayes Valley. We, we, but we got it started. It was originally yeah, virtual Valley or whatever. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Philip, thank you so much for spending time with us and sharing these stories with the community and your thoughts about the future as well. Um, very much appreciated. The community always, uh, is grateful for hearing your words. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It was good to be here. I wish we could, I wish I could more easily walk around and chat with everybody. It's, it's, we're, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. This has been super, uh, super amazing. Thanks, Philip. All right, for everyone else, just a reminder, don't miss tomorrow's final town hall. We'll be joined by the hardworking and ever talented moles. Then on next Monday, July 1st, we're pleased to welcome Linden Lab Executive Chairman Oberwolf Linden and Senior VP of Product Operations and Marketing, Patch Linden will join us again for our second community roundtable. We hope to see you there. Happy SL21B, everyone. Have a good day, and we'll see you soon.